The Boeing B-29 Super Fortress Enola Gay is the first aircraft to deliver an atomic weapon in combat in history. It's on August 6, 1945, and it led to the events to the end of World War II in August 1945 of VJ Day. Well, you know, the B-29 is the most advanced propeller-driven airplane in the world during World War II, especially 1945. And it's selected for the atomic mission. It, that platform has been proven with the 20th Air Force of being able to carry up to 20,000 pounds of bombs, the 2,000 miles to Japan and back. And the modifications of what are called the silver plate bombers, which the 15 bombers of the 509th Composite Group are modified for the atomic mission. It's a 10,000 pound bomb, atomic, and all the defensive armaments removed, and the, it's modified just for this atomic mission. And so you already have an airplane capable of high speed, high altitude, long range, and then you add the capability to carry this one specific weapon. So it's the perfect platform for carrying the atomic bomb. You know, the 509th is a specially trained unit. They're activated in December 1944, and they train specifically for the delivery of a single atomic bomb. They're activated, they go into a theater in the Marianas North Field on Tinian in the spring and summer of 1945, and they start having practice runs to Japan and back, dropping uh, pump, they're called pumpkins, they're big, the fat man bombs uh, that just have TNT in them. And so they're, they know they're gonna be practicing for the delivery of this single weapon. By the time of August, in which the first mission, the Hiroshima mission is planned, Colonel Paul Tibbetts is the commander of the unit. Tibbetts picks this airplane off the line at Glen the Glen L. Martin factory in Omaha, Nebraska. And Lewis receives it, the crew fly it over there at Tinian. So on August 5th, Tibbetts says, this is my airplane. I'm gonna fly for this atomic mission, the first one. He has a uh, person paint his mother's name on the side of the aircraft. And he's designated himself the command pilot Dutch Van Kirk as the navigator, and Tom Ferriby as the bombardier, and they also joined by Captain William S. Parsons as the weaponier and overall mission commander, and Morris Jeppesen, who's the assistant weaponier. So they're added to this crew. Some of the crew members come off, so some of the, they're bumped from the crew. Robert Lewis walks up and he's like, well, this has been my airplane, and it's now named Enola Gay, and I'm the co-pilot. And at three in the morning, August 6th, they take off from North Field, and they rendezvous with other aircraft, other B-29s of the 509th at Iwo Jima, and then they fly the rest of the 2,000 miles to Hiroshima and back. So it's a very uh, procedural mission. It's, they've trained for this. They all have their jobs. From the crew of 12, you have a private running the radio to a Navy captain who's been part of Project Alberta, which is the delivery program, the building of the actual bomb. So you have this range of experience, range of service being represented. So it's a very special mission. But also, it's that camaraderie, the esprit de corps, the professionalism of this Air Force crew, especially that core unit of Tibbetts, Ferriby, and Van Kirk that gets the, air, the airplane, the Enola Gay, to Hiroshima, that route. Then Ferriby aims and drops the bomb, and they get back home. The importance of Enola Gay is that it's a symbol of the rise of technology, especially in terms of the military airplane. Innovation that's made aircraft fly higher, faster, and farther. And this was the, this airplane was the, the epitome of that development starting in the 1920s with, through 1945. So it's the modern airplane in every sense of the word. The scope and the awareness of the importance of that mission, you, I think it's seen at a high level as a very important weapon. It's gonna be shaping the immediate post-war period. For the inv individuals on the airplane, like Robert Caron, who's the tail gunner, he takes a picture of that mushroom cloud coming up over Hiroshima. He records that moment. Robert Lewis, you know, writes in his diary later, oh, my God, what have we done? So the crew is, they're soaking it in, what does this really mean? For the Japanese, they, they do not answer the, the request to surrender. So August 9th, uh, Nagasaki's attacked. And, but it takes the, the second bombing that the emperor of Japan, who's never spoken to his people, he says, we are now, because of this new weapon, going to surrender. And so that's an unprecedented moment in the history of you know, Imperial Japan. The Enola Gay is a very important artifact, not only for the American people, but for the world overall. 
It's a symbol of the height of technology in terms of aeronautics and what a national culture did with the technology to win World War II. And so it's a symbol not only of the people who flew the mission, but also the people that actually fought the war overall. And especially in that idea for the American mindset, will this war ever end and how can we end that war? So it's a very important symbol in that regard. But also in terms of the overall use of nuclear weapons, it's a, it's a, it's a flashpoint for the discussion of what nuclear weapons and what role they should play in the modern defense establishment. The aircraft behind me is the B-29 boxcar. This airplane ended World War II. It dropped an atomic bomb on Nagasaki on August 9, 1945. This airplane is significant because even though it dropped the second atomic bomb, the war wasn't ended after the first bomb was dropped. And there was a lot of discussion about, well, should we drop the second bomb, should we not? Uh, but it was pretty clear that the Japanese were going to continue to fight. The option uh, that was left other than dropping the atomic bomb was a massive invasion of Japan, which would have resulted in millions of casualties among the Allies and among the Japanese. So the decision was made to drop this second bomb, and actually the target for that bomb was supposed to be a Japanese city called Kokura, but it turns out that there was smoke obscuring the city from a bombing raid that was nearby on that day. And the instructions were that they were to be able to actually see the target not use radar bombing, which they had that capability. So after three runs over Kokura and running low on fuel, the decision was made to attack the alternate target, which was Nagasaki. As the crew approached Nagasaki, it was covered in clouds, and so they were a bit concerned, will they have to bomb by radar or just ditch the bomb in the ocean? But just as they were about to go over the city, the clouds parted, they were able to see the target, and they bombed visually. B-29 was really a unique aircraft to begin with. It could fly farther, higher, faster, carry a heavier bomb load than nearly any bomber developed during World War II. It really was revolutionary. But the B-29s that were used for the, the atomic bombing raids were special B-29s. They had been specially modified to carry atomic bombs. The turrets that were on normal B-29s were taken off. The armor was taken off, so it lightened them. They could fly farther, a little faster, a little higher. They also modified the bomb bays to be able to carry these atomic weapons. Both the Fat Man and the Little Boy weighed about 10,000 pounds. The uh, B-29 boxcar carried the Fat Man bomb. And in fact, it really was the only bomber that the U.S. had at the time that could carry the Fat Man bomb. The crew was well aware of the gravity of the mission. They were involved in the two most expensive defense projects in World War II. The B-29 cost $3 billion in 1945 dollars to develop and build, and the atomic bomb cost about $2.2 billion to develop and build. So we committed huge national resources to develop both of these weapons. They knew the brutality of the war. They knew that it was dragging on and on. At the same time, these were professionals. That said, they had a lot of problems on the mission. Before they even took off, they had a problem with the fuel transfer pump, which meant that they weren't going to be able to utilize all the fuel in the airplane, but they still had to carry the fuel. Then, as they were approaching Japan, they were supposed to meet up with a photographic aircraft that would document the mission. They orbited for 45 minutes, waiting for this photographic airplane to show up. It never did. So they're low on fuel, they go to Kokura, the primary target. It's, it has smoke over it. They can't bomb visually. They make three runs. The fuel's getting lower and lower. Uh, in the end, though, they were able to get to Nagasaki and bomb visually. But even after that, they didn't have enough fuel to get back to their home base. So they had to divert to nearby Okinawa, where they were able to land. But as they were coming in on final approach, one of the engines ran out of fuel and stopped. And then after they landed, as they taxied to the end of the runway, another engine stopped. So that's how close it was with their fuel reserve. This is a Boeing B-29 Super Fortress. Uh, this particular model built in, in July 45, um, so it did not see any World War II combat history. It became a training B-29 
So even in Korea, it did not go overseas. And then it was decommissioned and it was sent to uh, the Naval Weapons Depot Center in China Lake, California. Uh, I'm not sure why, why it went to a Navy place, but it did. It was in there with a group of airplanes and basically forgotten. Uh, they didn't seem to have an inventory list on it anywhere. And so when the CAF was looking for, for one, there would seem to be none to be had anywhere. And then somebody happened to spot them, happened to fly overhead, spot the airplanes. And with that, they did a deeper search. And in fact, they found this airplane on inventory. And, the, um, and so the Air Force then donated to the Commemorative Air Force. The design of the aircraft was to essentially be able to reach uh, Japan. And so it's a long-range bomber, very advanced for its day, the first pressurized aircraft, the first aircraft to have remote uh, gun sights. So it has a sort of a very basic, uh, by today's standards, rather crude computer, but a good computer that would work. And all the gunner had to do was to get the sight on the aircraft for one second, and it was a sure kill. Very, very accurate. And if you'll notice that there are fewer guns than gunner positions. And so if an aircraft passed from left to right, the left gunner would have the gun and then release it to the right gunner. The gun would swing around and then be available to the other gunner. Very advanced for its day. They were put into production before they was really fully tested. It had a lot of, had a lot of errors, a lot of bugs in it, if you will. Um, and things were modified while they were being produced. You know, we really don't do that today. We get something that's pretty much complete and operational, meet, meeting certain criteria before we start producing you know, thousands of them or hundreds of them in these days. But in those days, they needed them right away. So they would modify an airplane on the fly or they'd have kits to modify them in the field afterwards. And so initially, they had problems. And in fact, at the very early part of their, of their use, they had more operational losses than combat losses. And it was tough on the tough on the crews because they you know they were working with something that was uh, they felt was unsafe, but they stuck with it. And little by little, the kits and improvements, and they figured out how to fly and how to modify, it, and it became a, a good, safe airplane. And it was very, very effective at what it did. Um, I have a special tie to this plane. My father is the my father was a B-29 project guy during World War II, and he joined the CAF in 1960 and they decided it needed a you know, complete set of World War II American aircraft initially and he didn't feel the you know, collection would be complete without a B-29 and out of the over 3,600 made there were none to be had anywhere. Um, there were only a few that were in guard posts or museums. They finally found this one just out of, out of luck. He paid for the restoration of it and, uh, and then they named it uh, Fifi after my mother. So he flew it for a number of years. He's now passed away, and I'm now the last four years I've been flying the airplane, and it's a you know it's a thrill.